I do and I don't. I have a new book out called A Course in Miracles and this is actually an anthology. So each chapter is A Course in Miracles and Hinduism, A Course in Miracles and Zen Buddhism, A Course in Miracles and Judaism, A Course in Miracles and Christian Science, Unity, Rudolf Steiner, Sigmund Freud, Quantum Physics, Krishnamurti, etc. The cover, yeah, the cover. Um, somebody, uh, from there. <laughs> Brad did the cover. It's, a nice cover. It's, it's sort of a nice cover. It's kind of got, it's a picture of a book with uh, like steam or something coming out of the book and how the course relates to all these other. We're going to be talking about this in general today. You'll understand what I mean by talking about it in general in a minute. And then I have another book coming out in February. That's called uh, course in, A Course in Mysticism and Miracles. I'll be talking a little bit about that as well uh, as the time goes by. And that's kind of, I think most of our, what we're going to do right now is we go till a quarter or three. We take a break and uh, till three o'clock and then we come back and we go till around four o'clock. All right. So I'm beginning to think about another book. And in the process of thinking about another book, I think what I'd like to do for the next few sessions is not to pick a specific part of the course, but to kind of pick up different subjects and topics in the course. And this is just a little bit of get how things are beginning to gel into another book. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about awakening to the one mind. That's going to be the theme for the conference that we're going to have in October, because this is actually what the Course says that we're doing. We are awakening. Uh, we're, we're sort of struggling to awake uh, from the, the dream. So the Course actually at one point says that the, the thoughts you think you think are not your real thoughts. Because the thoughts that you think that you think are a part of dreaming. So you may think that you're perfectly awake while you're driving your car, and I hope that you are in some sense awake. Uh, but on another level, you're dreaming. Uh, you're fantasizing about situation or somebody, or you're going over some problems, uh, money, health, you know, all the issues that can come up in life. But the Course would say your nighttime dreams and your daytime dreams have a different form, that's all. Right? So it's still dreaming. It's not really being fully awake. To be fully awake would be to be back with one mind. Again, let's remember who Jesus is in terms of the Course in Miracles, the definition. The definition is Jesus was a man who saw the face of Christ in all of his brothers and sisters, and remembered God. So the first part, that, so what was required is that we see the face of Christ in everyone, everyone. That's, that's a very important point. Uh, there's, everyone is absolutely equal here. We may have different bodies, of course. The form is different, but the mind is one. And it's, it's reuniting with that mind that really brings us our greatest joy to get, to get out of our own level of insanity. And again, we'll remember and underline the fact that the Course says that we're all insane. It's not simply some of our leaders, but <laughs> we're all insane in some different way. And we're, what we're doing is we're struggling to awaken from the dream. So what you're doing here Sometimes I'll, I'll come and I'll look around and I think, what are you doing here? <laughs> why, are, why are we here uh, sitting and listening, talking about this stuff? 
And it's obvious because we're actually we're trying to, to wake up and we're waking up together. We're, that's what makes it nice. That, that we're, you recognize what happens when you, as we do wake up, is you recognize that there is just this one mind and it's an awakened mind. So uh, I'm also going to be talking about so, a little bit about mysticism today, non dualism in particular, and the universal course. Um, there's a line in the Course in Miracles which said, and I think it's on a slide that's coming up here pretty soon. Uh, that it's one form of a universal course. And I'll be showing you how it is that this is, in a way, there's nothing new in the course. What's new about the course, what's wonderful about the course, is the packaging. Uh, it, the fact that it came to us through the mind and the hands of a, a brilliant a uh, PhD psychologist at Columbia University here in New York City who really understood Freud and the whole history of psychology uh, very, very well. Uh, the course is clear. Freud got it right in terms of understanding how the ego thing works. Uh, the place where Freud missed was he was an atheist. So that meant that there was no exit. There was no door. There was no way to get free of this insane mind. Of course, America says, no, you can get free of the same, uh, the insane mind the same way that Jesus got free of it. But let's talk about when, let, if a Buddha, let's say, or a Jesus really got free through the process of meditation. I mean, Jesus has his 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness before there's a single word of ministry. Nothing happens until after that event. So Buddhists sitting for the seven years under the Bodhi tree before he gets it and, and wakes up. And you're maybe if you know the Buddhist story, when he goes back to the, the deer park at Benares, the, his old disciples see him coming, <clears throat> and they recognize that something is different about him, something has changed. And they say, what, what is it? What, 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 there's something changed about you. And he says, yes, I am awake. I'm awake. That's the difference. He, he, he woke up. He got free of the dream. There's lots of ways of getting free of the dream. Meditation is certainly one path. But let's recognize meditation takes a lot of time and effort, and you've got to uh, really be devoted to, to doing that. Again, you should be doing it, you're, you're employing it in your process. But another process is well, study. And so that's what we're doing. We're studying this as a class. I think of myself as a teacher and nothing but a teacher. So that's it. Just someone that's working on this workbook just and lessons and text just the same way that, that you are. So let's start looking a bit into our material. I just thought this was fun <laughs> as a starter. Okay, there it goes. Uh, I want to read you a passage from A Course in Miracles, which goes along with this uh, particular image, which really explains what we're, what we're about. <clears throat> this is from chapter 18, section 8, uh, paragraph uh, 3. Within this kingdom the ego rules and cruelly, and to defend this little speck of dust... It bids you fight against the universe. Now, the little speck of dust is your body, okay? This fragment of your mind is such a tiny part of it that could you but appreciate the whole, you would see instantly that it's like the smallest sunbeam to the sun or like the faintest ripple on the surface of the ocean. In its amazing arrogance, this tiny sunbeam has decided it's the sun. This almost imperceptible ripple hails itself as the ocean. Think how alone and frightened is this little thought, this infinitesimal illusion holding itself apart against the universe. The sun becomes the sunbeam's enemy that would devour it, and the ocean terrifies the little ripple that would swallow it. <laughs> So, you know, that's just where we are when we're caught up in our, our little ego worlds. 
which are actually non-realities. They're non-realities insofar as, again, the whole thing is very simply a dream. And just as you have a dream at night and you wake in the morning, uh, so when we are free of the dreaming ego, we find something wholly new and quite wonderful and beyond what we were thinking. All right? So, let's start off with um, the truth is true. I gave a lecture last Sunday or Sunday before, I guess it was, I can't remember, recently, uh, on transcendentalism at a Unitarian church, and I talked about the basic <coughs> principles of transcendentalism, and the first one is that the truth is true. Okay? So it's, this is the same, we would all agree with this. Nothing else matters, nothing else is real, and everything beside it is not there. That's because it's a dream, right? Let me make this one distinction for you that you cannot make but need to learn. Your faith in nothing is deceiving you. Now the nothingness is our soap operas, our own dramas, the, the, the story, or the story that we see in the world as it's being played out, uh, for example, in politics, which we're all very much aware of what's going on, but it's just a story, it's just a dream, it's just a fantasy that's going on in the same way that the same fantasy has always been going on, whether whoever is uh, at the top of the heap. Offer your faith to me and I will hold it gently in the holy place where it belongs. You will find no deception there, but only the simple truth and you will love it because you will understand it. There's nothing like, you know the, the saying that you will find the truth and the truth will make you free? And in a way, there, there's nothing more exciting than being free, being liberated from whatever it is that we're liberated from financial problems, from a health problem, from whatever the office. If you don't have that, that's joyful. That's a great joy. And from having read a lot of the near-death experience books, <laughs> Uh, they all say the same thing about the body. That when you, when you get free of it, we're, we're so frightened of dying. And we're frightened of dying because we're afraid that we're going to lose the dream. And you are <laughs> going to lose the dream. But what's on the other side of this dream is so much better than the dream that they, sometimes people say it's like looking back at the body for a moment is like just look at some old clothes that are laying there and and there's, the, the body is actually a confinement. It's actually a, a limitation in form. And it, there's a, a one point in the course where it refers to the body as dense, the dense body. Or another point it refers to it as gross. And it, it is gross on some level. I think I told you about experience I had. I won't elaborate it again in detail, but when I had encephalitis and when I came out of the encephalitis, which I was in a coma for quite a while, and just trying to get back into the body again, took, it took a really long time. And then when I came home from the hospital, uh, the first time I tried to eat, just watching my wife and daughter, I thought, this is the grossest thing that they're, you know, <laughs> 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 Teeth, <laughs> eating chicken, you know, I couldn't even eat because, you know, you, if you don't eat for a long enough period of time, you lose your appetite. And, but it did, it was just, you understand what I'm saying. Hey, and I got thinking about other parts of this, and I thought they, they were really like the, the elimination process. We won't talk about that. <laughs> and then I thought about sex, too. Sex is a very strange thing, if you think about it. it just, it, well, we want to do that. That's really strange. <laughs> Yes. We, um, I believe most of us in here are aware of this, but if you're not, I, I think it's important to point it out. You see where it says, let me and have faith and offer your faith to me. Right. Both of those me's are uppercase. Right. That's pointing to the part of our mind that speaks for the truth in us, which is God's voice, which is the Holy Spirit. It's not Jesus. Jesus is never uppercased in The Course in Miracles because he says, do not think of me that way. I am your complete equal. The only thing that is different of me now is I know nothing but God. 
You know, so Jesus is never uppercased in the course. Whenever it's uppercased, it's referring to the Holy Spirit's voice that Jesus only listens to. So he's pointing to the Holy Spirit when it says me and me. Thanks, Brad. Mm. That's right. There's another point in the course where he says that there's no difference between us uh, except in time. But seeing how there's no time, <laughs> there's no difference. Uh, and what it really means that when we think about there's no difference between any of us, let's keep in mind that that's on the level of mind, on the level of mind. Obviously, the bodies are very different, but let's also keep in mind that these bodies are very, very temporal. Uh, they, they really only last for a moment, out, out, brief candle, and, and really it's, it is just for, for a moment. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the level of mind, not the level of the, anything physical or anything of the world. <clears throat> Let's move on. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk about that. The Course is not a religion. I think that's, this is a, an important point. It, it's a course of study. So attempting to formalize the truth into laws, into dogmas and creeds and rituals, takes us actually away from the truth. And this has been one of the problems of the church, uh, all churches, or not just churches, but denominations of all sorts. First, there comes the mystic, like a Jesus or a Buddha, who has the insight, who sees the truth. And then the next thing you know, people say, this is great, let's Build a church. Let's write some creeds. Let's make up some laws that people must believe and say every Sunday. And if you've ever been stuck in having to say the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed, Sunday after Sunday, you think, whoa, whoa, why am I saying this? Really? Descend into hell and sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty? Oh, my God, where did this stuff come from? So the form then becomes a block to the awareness of love's presence, just as anything which is a form because we're talking about an experience. An experience is not a part of form. That even includes, again, the body, with which we are so very heavily identified. Right? Love doesn't have a form. It cannot be delimited to form. God. You know what God is? God is God, misspelled. <laughs> <laughs> My assistant proved this, too. I don't know. <laughs> God does not have a form. God does not have a form. The truth does not have a form, right? Truth is true regardless. Everything which is really important doesn't have a form. And let's go on. Oops. Oh, my gosh. It was working so good, Paul. Okay, uh, here we go. So thought, though it can be seen in form, heaven doesn't have a form. Uh, heaven is a state of being. Former religion, as I said, is an attempt to concretize and to make real in an external way what can only be known within. That's why Jesus repeatedly says, you know, it. The kingdom of heaven is inside you. Inside you is not your body. Inside you is your mind. And again, the mind, of course, obviously doesn't have a form. Going on with this. So I want to talk a little bit about the universal course. <clears throat> um, having worked with the course for well over 40 years. Um, I'm, the way that I met Helen and Bill in the first place, in 1973, was that they came to a talk that I was doing on mysticism. And I was always interested in the mystics because the mystics were these people who had these experiences of union or connection or seeing or revelation that came to them in different ways. It might have been meditation. It might just have happened out of nowhere. Uh, it could have happened. So Jacob Boma, who was a mystic from the 
17th century who wrote a book called Aurora, which is kind of like the Course in Miracles of, this, of the 17th century, a long time ago, uh, was catapulted into a mystical experience when a light on a pewter dish flashed into his eyes in a, such a way that it put him into like a trance-like state. And then he, from then on, he, he was like I said, sort of the Swedenborg was the Course in Miracles of the eight, 18th century. You can keep running down the road like this and seeing how it's been coming to us in different forms for different ages and different times. But again, what makes the Course so wonderful is this level, it's 21st century document. We're ready for greater depth uh, even than could previously uh, come our way. But there is a universal course. <clears throat> the course says, as I said earlier, that it's one part. It says, this is a manual for a special curriculum intended for teachers of a special form of the universal course. There are many thousands of other forms, all with the same outcome. Now, uh, recently, some of you may know there's a, not new, but relatively new book called The Course of Love, which some people are enjoying reading and studying. It's different than The Course in Miracles. It doesn't have the iambic pentameter. It doesn't have the blank verse. It doesn't have the, some of the same, the, the tone is different completely because it came through a different, different channel. But the much of the message is the same message. Another way of saying this is there are a lot of doors that lead us into heaven and a lot of pathways to lead to those doors, but once you cross through the door, there's just one God, there's just one mind, there's just one experience. And I was listening to a tape of Ken Watnick <coughs> yesterday as I was driving home from the city and somebody asked him a question about reading other material, and he said, yes, he thought that was fine. You know, I mean, why not? I mean, he'd read plenty of other stuff before. And he was a mystic him, himself and a psychologist before the Course came into his lap, and he realized that this was sort of a golden representation of the truth or of the universal Course. So there's nothing wrong in that. I, I enjoy it. I will continue to enjoy it as supplement although my heart is with the Course, I appreciate the fact that there's other insights that can actually help you understand the Course. And by that I mean, I, I'm just saying, don't reject it. it. I think there's great value in sticking with a path. But this doesn't mean you have to kick the other paths away and say that there, there's no validity in them. So many thousands of paths means that there are many thousands upon thousands upon thousands of pathways. Uh, you could even say <clears throat> that there are many pathways as there are people on the planet. Because we're all looking to get home again. That's inside everybody. It's inside even those who would appear to be very, very lost. And very, very caught in the dream and in the world. Uh, but there's still that desire that's down inside everyone somewhere, you know, to, to really know what love is, to really know what the truth is, to really know what God is. That's what we're doing here. Let's go on. <clears throat> so, um, hold on. So this is Bill and Helen. Uh, Bill said that he thought the Course in Miracles was uh, the Christian Vedanta, okay? So let's, so it's a non-dualistic system. By the way, traditional Christianity is a dualistic system. What I mean by that is tradi traditional Christianity certainly posits the existence of heaven, but it also posits the existence of hell. And it's, it therefore comes up with an exclusive property, that there are certain people who do not get into heaven. That is completely, if we're all equal and we're all the same and there's only one mind, you know, then there, no one is exempt. <laughs> no one is left out. And if you're working with a philosophy that says only certain people can be allowed 
end to heaven, go the other way. <laughs> you know, let's look at one, one of the universal forms. So Vedanta <clears throat> says that Brahma or, that, or God and the self are one. Same thing as the Course, right? And then the line from the Course, every child of God is one in Christ, for his being is in Christ as Christ is in God. There's a line in the Bible where Jesus says, I am the vine, you, I'm, you are the branches, right? It just, it's all, but it's all connected. We're all really one. He says things like, what I have done, you can do too. And you want to wonder, well, why don't we do it? <laughs> the reason we don't do it is we have a lot of resistance to doing it, and we have a lot of resistance to doing it uh, in good part because we're afraid. We're afraid for God to win because we're afraid that, that, that if God wins, we're going to lose, and that's true uh, on the ego level. So that, that, that gets, uh, it's not killed or squashed or or destroyed in any way. Sometimes you hear people talking about destroying the ego or killing the ego. No, no, that's, that's, <laughs> it just disappears into the nothingness out of which it came in the first place. How can you kill something? That's an a, attack. And of course, it's very much uh, opposed to attack. By the way, it's slightly off, but on, did some of you, uh, Brad said he saw it, watch this week. Uh, I love watching American Masters on PBS. Did you see the show about uh, Theodore Roosevelt going up the Amazon by any chance? It's a really, my, my wife had read this book uh, some months ago actually called The River of Doubt. And it, this was after he was given up on trying to be president and he was an adventurer so he went off to the Amazon and the Amazon kind of whipped his, substitute another word there, and <laughs> He came back. I mean, he never really regained his health. It really knocked him for a, for a loop. But um, he had a guide, and the guide's name was Rondon. You can look this up in uh, Wikipedia, right? Who was from uh, Brazil, who was trying to make contact with the native Indians who lived in the jungles and to see about doing whatever they could and by way of communication with them and helping them. And he used a very interesting methodology. Uh, one of the methodologies he carried with him amongst all the other stuff they had on their backpacks and animals, <clears throat> an old Victrola with a, a, a crank Victrola that you would play records. So he had these operatic records and he would put an operatic thing on in the jungle, right? And it was this beautiful sound, something that these native people had never heard before. And they would just sort of start appearing from inside the jungle and looking around to sort of see what, what it was that, that was going on. And, make, and, but, and therefore making friends with them, rather than going in aggressively attacking them. Right, in fact, as was an interesting event occurred, his philosophy is called based on the work of August Comte, I'll talk about that later, it's called positivism. Positivism is a form of the universal course. We're gonna see in a minute some of the different forms of a universal course. These are all saying essentially the same thing. They're all non-dualistic, for example, right? So his personal philosophy was, and this is an interesting line, die if you must, but never take another life, right? Die if you must, but never. So the consequence, one of his people, men were killed by one of the natives. He did not take revenge. He did not revenge that death, right? Die if you must, but don't kill another one. Can you imagine what it would have been like if we had approached American Indians that way with that philosophy? Rather than doing what we did, right? We went in there, it's, it's, it's actually, if, when you, if you look at statistics, it's, it's the worst disaster. E even more were killed 
the Spanish coming in from the west and the European, northern Europeans from the east, and we just decimated this country. Okay, let's go on. So this is a prayer from Lesson uh, 329. I'm going to read it, and I'm going to suggest that after I read it, that we all read it together. Okay, and I'm going to suggest that as we read it together, uh, that you stop for a second at each period. Okay, and me, but this is about the idea we're on here, where there's just one. As you are one, so am I one with you. And this I choose in my creation, where my will became forever one with yours. That choice was made for all eternity. I cannot change but be in opposition. It cannot change and be in opposition to itself. Father, my will is yours. And I am safe, untroubled, and serene in endless joy because it is your will that this be so. Now keep in mind, the whole Course in Miracles is about retraining the mind. It's about helping us to see things in a wholly different way. So this prayer is really an affirmation about the direction that we're wanting to go in. So let's do it together, and we'll stop for a, a couple of seconds on each period, okay? As you are one, so am I one with you. And this I choose in my creation, where my will became forever one with yours. That choice was made for all eternity. It cannot change and be in opposition to itself. Father, my will is yours, and I am safe, untroubled and serene, in endless joy, because it is your will that this be so. So, and see, like, that choice was made for all eternity. That the choice <clears throat> has already been made. It's done, which is another reason why this is a dream, or kind of a, a backflash experience that we're having. This, this, there's a line in the Course in Miracles that says, this world was over long ago. <laughs> Which is why it now makes it a dream. So this is where we're going. We're just recognizing, as you are one, so am I one with you. This, this, there's no room for arrogance here. It's quite the opposite of the arrogance, right? It's just recognizing our true identity. We're just trying to get back to our true identity. All right, we'll go on. So, I'd just like to point out to you some of the different examples of a universal course uh, from the past. I'm going to mention just a couple. There's lots that I could go into, but and then we kind of becomes a classroom class. <laughs> but that's okay. So from the past, we have like Neoplatonism and Gnosticism. I'll explain what those are in just in a second, in case you don't know. And from the past and present. By past, I mean. You don't find many Neoplatonists or Gnostics around anymore. <laughs> uh, but Vedanta is still very much with us. Zen Buddhism is still with us. Sikhism is with us. Taoism, Hasidism, Kabbalism, perennialism, uh, or just the perennial philosophy. The uh, person who made that really famous was Aldous Huxley. I'll talk about it later, but it wasn't Huxley that first started talking about it. Christian mysticism, transcendentalism. Transcendentalism was like the Course in Miracles of the, of the 19th century. And I just, and that sort of died. It began to dissipate. Um, There's it, almost an exact parallel with the life of Emerson. Uh, Emerson was born in 1803, died in 1879. And that's just about the time that, that Transcendentalism was a a dominant philosophy or a major philosophy, so it was not in excess of, say, traditional Christianity. But like Thoreau, for example, was one of our greatest uh, transcendentalists, uh, never went to church, ever. His church was kind of like uh, Emily Dickinson's another one. 
I love this quote from Dickens. Let's see if I get this right. Uh, some keep the Sabbath by going to church. I keep it by staying home with a bubble ink for a choir and an orchard for a dome. <laughs> she had these really these little, sharp, quick poems like Lynn writes. All right? uh, Unitarian Universalism, which is saying that there's only one. Uh, positivism, which was the philosophy of Rondon, the Brazilian explorer that went up the Amazon with Theodore Roosevelt. Theosophy and many more. Now I'm just going to talk about a couple uh, here. Um, we'll talk about Neoplatonism, just to give you an idea what this is all about. <clears throat> so Plotinus, who lived from, as uh, you can see, 507 to uh, 270, is considered the father of Neoplatonism. So his philosophy is really a renewal of Plato. That's why Neoplatonism. And Plato's philosophy is the ideal, what he, what he called the, we call idealistic monism. All is one. Important point is one. So the formless soul is real. The gross body is not, simply because it's mortal. There is a world soul which is the mind, above the intellect, is the one. It, it's above the intellect. You know, we, there's a point at which we actually are transcending thinking in the normal form of what we call thinking, because thinking is something which is limited to, well, words, for example. Words are forms. A spoken word is a sound vibration, that's a form, a written word, is a, a, a form, and we're moving more into the intu intuitive dimension now, where we're moving into wordlessness, but a kind of knowing. We've talked about this before in terms of knowing. When you know something, you, you know it. <laughs> and you don't have doubt about it. It's not something that, that, that's, that's questioned, right? And let's go on. So uh, this is, uh, of course, back in Plotinus' day, there were no pictures, but there were statues. What happened? <laughs> Just press it by accident. Commercial break. <laughs> Commercial break? I have no idea what happened. I must have hit this button or something. Yeah, that's okay. All right, well, just keep going up to Plotinus. I'm going to lay this thing down. Okay. <laughs> Mankind is poised mid midway between the gods and the beasts. It's an interesting thing for him to have said, and if you think about it, that's really... The problem is these bodies. Uh, these bodies appear to be very real. Uh, they appear to have some of the same qualities of beasts. For one thing, we, uh, we only live by other things dying. We have to eat, we eat animals, or vegetable. Ken used to make fun of people who wouldn't eat an animal because, but they would eat carrots. He said, you, you kill the carrot, you know, <laughs> before you can eat it. It's still, it was a living thing, and you took its life and devoured this. It's impossible not to do that sort of thing. But one of the problems is that Although there is only the ideal, only the mind is real, only love is real, only truth is real, right now, just this moment, in space and time, you seem to be inhabiting a body. We all seem to be inhabiting a body, and that body appears to have certain kinds of needs that we have to take care of in the context of the world. And really what the Course says is that, you know, this is a school, and I don't know a single esoteric philosophy that doesn't say that. So we are here to learn something, and we're learn the body is then becomes a tool, a mechanism through which we are engaged in the process of learning. And what we're trying to learn in part is how to get out of here. Lately, I've been thinking that rather than thinking of this as a school, we might think of it as a hospital. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> We're all patients, yeah, uh, trying to learn patience. <laughs> Did it say that? We're all patients? We're all patients. Oh, that's great. I'll find the quote and I'll all right. find out here. Actually, I think rather than patients, we're all, this is a rehabilitation uh, center. <laughs> <laughs> Aldous Huxley once said during the Second World War that he thought this place was probably another planet's hell. <laughs> and if you were writing, you know, in England during the Second World War, it could very much have looked like you were in some sort of hell. I mean, it was. War is hell, yeah. right? As Tatunka Sherman, I think, is the first person to say that. So, uh, let's go on. So, according to Plato, knowledge is a matter of recollection. It comes not simply through observation, right? It comes from divine insight. Now, divine insight is another basic concept in transcendentalism. So, what, what transcendentalism is saying is that it's possible to know something without reading anything. It's possible to just kind of wake up. You don't have to have bookish knowledge to have knowledge. You, it, we, again, we're transcending the intellect. We call it divine knowledge. And according to Plato's teacher Socrates, he, sues, he who sees with his eyes is blind. That's true in so far as what we see is the outside world. And the Course is saying there's nothing outside of you, meaning there's nothing outside of your mind. And because of these eyes, because of all of our senses, we are very externally oriented. We think that it's real. I think it's interesting. We have one of these, and I've seen much bigger ones than we have, high-definition TV screens in our uh, family room. And it's so brilliant sometimes. I mean, this high-definition, I mean, it looks very real. It's sort of... <laughs> <laughs> we just keep kind of emphasizing, you see New York City from the air, and like, whoa, look at that thing. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? It's, and it's, it's out, out there, and we're fascinated with what's out there, and we, we want to get more simulation, so we go to Disneyland, or <laughs> whatever it is that we can create. We have our, our 3D, uh, but again, it's all outside. Right? It's not, what do you, what do, you do? You, you join the monastery, you go inside, you go into a cloistered situation, you, 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 you have a little cell that you live in, you try to get into the mind. In the same way, the Course asks us to turn to the remembrance of God still shining in your quiet mind. So it's always there, quietly shining in the mind. And now I just want to say a word about Gnosticism. I only do, I only do Neoplatonism and Gnosticism briefly. This is to give you a historical background a little bit. So Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis, meaning to uh, have, having knowledge. It originates from the Jewish teachings from the Torah of the first and the second centuries. They believe that a divine spark exists in every mind. Now, we've seen this phrase many times, I think about 27 times or something in the Course in Miracles. It talks about the little spark, a divine spark. Uh, you find it in the teachings of Meister Eckhart, great mystic of the Middle, Middle Ages. Also talking about the divine spark that exists in every mind. And that spark can be reignited uh, it could happen through study, as I've said. It could happen through what happened to uh, <clears throat> Burma, who suddenly had a, this is a light coming into his eyes. It's not. That spark can be liberated through gnosis or knowledge. Um, I think I mentioned to you, um, and I would love to get him here, and if you're watching this, I want you to come. 
<laughs> His name is John Mark Stroud. Go look up John Mark Stroud on YouTube sometime. Uh, John Mark uh, had an, an oh, awakening experience, experience right, of awakening. And he seems to have been holding on to it. I mean, to not get, it's very easy for us to have moments of enlightenment and then be re seduced by the problems of the world. But uh, he's a teacher. And I was watching a recent one of his talks on YouTube. And he keeps talking about gnosis. He kept, that's the word he uses, gnosis, or, or, or knowing. You get to this point where there is a knowing. You know God. You know love. It's not anything that's questionable. So Gnosticism flourished in the Mediterranean world in conjunction with and influenced by early Christian mysticism and Neoplatonists. Now, you don't find Neoplatonists and Gnostics. I mean, there may be some Gnostics around somewhere. I'm not sure. Uh, but it's all in keeping with the same kind of philosophy as the Course. And here's one of my favorite guys, uh, John Lennon. He says, it seems to me that the only true, now see, he's before Course here, right? The only true Christians were the Gnostics, who believed in self-knowledge, i.e. becoming Christ themselves, reaching the Christ within. The light is the truth. Turn on the light, all the better to see you with, my dear. <laughs> As a little, I spent a half a day with John and Yoko and three other friends, and on another occasion I'll tell you what maybe with the circumstances around how we wound up spending a half day together. Uh, but uh, the thing that struck me about John, and that always does, I suppose, when you're with somebody who's very famous, this is 1969, he just seemed like the most ordinary human being. <laughs> you know, we're all that. We're, we're just all, remember last week I said we're all, we're all people here. <laughs> Regardless of who you are, we're all just people here. Hey, John. Yes. I found it. Oh, okay. So uh, this is in the psychotherapy pamphlet, and it says, Ideally, psychotherapy is a series of holy encounters in which brothers meet to bless each other and to receive the peace of God. And this will one day come to pass for every quote-unquote patient on the face of this earth, for who except a patient could possibly come to enter here? Right. I think actually we did use that when we when yeah, we went over so the psychotherapy pamphlet. Who, who possibly could come here but a patient? Right. You know, because we right. we're 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 believing in a world of insanity rather mm -hmm. than a the world that's sane, which is all there is. So this is an insane asylum. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it really is. The, the Course says power. that. Yeah. Right. It, it, it says, this I is an it. insane world, and never underestimate never the extent of its way. insanity. <laughs> what we're really trying to do is how to, in part, I think, maintain sanity in an insane world. If, if you can't get to being fully awake yet, just know you're on the way there, but the task in the meantime is maintaining sanity in an insane world. Part of that is recognizing that the world is insane, but you don't have to be insane because the world is insane. I mean, you don't have to, in, you don't have to participate in the insanity of the world. And the way, main way that you do that, by the way, in the most obvious, simple way, is not by getting caught in the insanity of the world which in the first instance means dropping projection. Projection makes perception. Uh, John uh, Mark Stroud really said, really emphasized the fact that the main thing, and the Course does this too. I was, again, listening to the Course driving into the city, and the main thing is, is it's the judgment that's the problem. It dropping judgment. And just letting the judgment be. I mean, it's really, it's not necessarily that you drop the, well, of course, you draw, want to drop the judgment, but the first step is just to see the judgment. I mean, just to see how incredibly judgmental we are. And you begin to see it. And one of the ways that you will see it, of course, is in your friends. 
<laughs> rather than in, just a second yeah. for both of you rather than in yourself and watch when you get into a discussion a situation which can happen very easily that's a judgment let's just say about the man who is president of this country so then you know and then when we feed each other on that you know and then one feeds the other one the other one feeds the other one and then we just get into it like in we're having glory and finding all the problems that are out there, right? Stop it. <laughs> now, there were two hands. Uh, you want to start, Beverly, and then back, pass it back to uh, Stravo. Hello. Yeah. There were two things I wanted to, to share. One of them is a little humorous. Good. I saw a quote on Facebook that I immediately co-opted. It said, you don't have to be insane to be my friend. I'll train you. <laughs> <laughs> I related to that immediately. Got it. Pass your mic sec, back to. Uh, the sec, oh, okay. oh, yeah, just get more. One okay. the, yeah, this was um, because I've been studying. I see things differently. Fortunately, you know, a little at a time. But I saw a movie that I would never have seen the way I saw it now. The movie was called Downsizing, mm. and the premise of the movie is to save the planet. They figured out a way to shrink people. <laughs> and so they would consume less of the resources. <laughs> and it's very funny, and it could sound like a real sci-fi thing, but I took away something very deep from this movie. Oh, yeah. I took away, as they didn't, I don't think they even realized how deep the movie was, that when this guy allowed himself to be downsized, his world changed. Of course. The, the, and I thought that... Maybe not too many people would see the movie that way, but it spoke like volumes to me when I saw it. Of course. I pass the mic back. Hi, John. Hi, Savro. So, um, uh, I, I really en uh, appreciate and enjoy reading Ken Wapnick also. I'm really spending a lot of time with it, uh, particularly his uh, a pamphlet book called um, um, Form Versus Content. Oh yeah, terrific, terrific pamphlet. Very I, rec much what we're talking about. I recommend it to everyone, and um, particularly in, in light of you know non-dualism, mm -hmm. and um, he make he makes the point which I really struck me. He said the course of miracles is not about love, the course of miracles is about guilt. That's right. And to to live a life without guilt, and the guilt is the guilt of separation. Right. So um, which where everything else. It, it engenders everything else, engenders right. project, projection and all that. So in terms of like separation and, and um, dualism, the, they're, all, they're all part and parcel the same. All right. And um, so it really... Um, I got it. Yeah, yeah. Once you can deal with the, to, help, to begin to work on and dealing with the guilt, to becoming the free, the, see, the basic guilt that we all have is that we have separated ourselves from the source, from the one, from, from God. And that we chose to do that, we chose to, to have this experience of individuality, right, which sort of makes us like king. Special. Right, it's like, thank you very much God, I'm gonna do it myself, sort of philosophy, but then that's the thing that gets us into trouble. But as we begin to deal with that and begin to live a life free of guilt, but the, which really means to be free of selfishness, mm -hmm. You know, free of the egotism, free of the, <clears throat> you know, the taking. And we start learning how to do the giving part. We'll talk about another day. I want to talk about the laws of giving and receiving. Go just, ahead. This was one on a humorous note Yeah. about non-dualism and dualism. Yeah. I think non-dualism is so much better <laughs> than, than dualism <laughs> by far. <laughs> That's exactly the point. Yeah, that's that's really that's really that's exactly the point. Yeah, because the moment you say that something's better than something else, I'm right and you're wrong, right? Then that's yeah, that's the split. better. <laughs> okay. Was there okay? Beverly, you keep, you keep it. Uh, somebody in the front row has to hold on to that. This is just a picture I have. Because, you probably have seen this picture a lot. I need, do anybody know who the artist is on this? It's a very old, it's often used uh, to represent 
See, this is the world. There's the sun and the earth and the star, I mean, the whole world, the, the sort of the universal world, right? And then this is the mystic who's sticking his head out into, this is like a wheel and uh, this is a whole mathematical, it's another dimension, right? And it's just sort of seeing the, to see the other dimension, which is what the Course is asking. Not to see the world, but to see something that transcends the world, right? So the universal course is non-dualistic, what we're talking about. Uh, it's very simply put, non-dualism means not to. There is no self and other. There's no such thing as subject-object. That's, that's a basic to understanding mystical philosophy. It's, it's a matter of becoming one with. And that there's a sense in which sometimes we fall in love, for example, we may feel as though we are blending, we're merging, we're becoming one with. It could be an, another, or it could be music, or uh, it could be art, or there's something about the fact that we can blend with it that makes it exciting and real. Um, so non-dualism is a state of being in which there is no dichotomy, no I and other. This is so important in terms of understanding the Course. It, everybody gets into heaven, okay? I mean, every, there is no exemption. <laughs> well, that's also true. <laughs> but, so but what we have to do is to awaken to that memory. Awaken to the fact that nobody has ever left, but we don't see that. We think that something has been left out. So we're at equality. We have absolute equality across the board. All right. So um, awareness then is being or presence. I like these, all of these words. Just being, and then notice this is uh, from page seventy in the course. Being, just being, just pure being is a state in which the mind is in communication with everything that's real. And I, this is, there's that, that connection, the communica it's a communication that's going on. Uh, it's not isolation at all, but it's not a subject-object either. There's just this sort of a immediacy of the presence of being in this state. And that's what mystics always use words like that to describe this experience. I, I just want to say, um, this it, it is wild. It's wild when, um, you, like, when things happen and you don't know, and it's so painful. And then looking back, if that didn't happen, uh, I wouldn't be where I am now. Right. And like, and all things. Uh, oh, I I sent you a text. I don't know if you got it, but I. I just I found another way to work the course, um, one lesson a day. But I choose the lesson I'm going to do. Oh, okay. Yeah, I I and um, today I chose lesson seventy five. Um, the light, the light is in me. In me. Right. I think that that's that's good, Lynn. Uh, First, I would be sure I had done it at least once through, from, oh, yeah. 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 No, once, I've done it a few times. Yes, I thought you had. One, but you got to, the first time at least, yeah. you go through, and then come back. All right, we're going another five minutes, we'll take our break. Uh, let's go on. So, true authority. This is a quote, direct quote from the Course. A miracle is a change of mind about the world about the way we see the world. That's not from the Course, that's from me. If it's in italics, it's from the Course. To change your mind means to a place at the disposal of true authority. So true authority means that rather than letting the ego run the show, we're allowing for a higher authority to be in charge. And our task is one of aligning our minds with that mind so that that mind can then work through us. Jesus in the Gospels says, 
It is not I who speak, but it is the Father who speaks through me. And so we actually want to get to that point where, again, and we've given illustrations in the past, like if you you get a poem in or something, and it's not like it's from you, it just came through you, and that's when it really feels very, very good. The, the, the connection is the right, the right words are given you to say to someone in counseling, for example, etc. Also, so although beingness may be appear spontaneous, it is usually realized, as I said earlier, through some prolonged study, meditation, contemplation practices, such as workbook of the course. And somehow I think I skipped one there. Yeah, I did. The communication link that God himself placed within you, joining your mind with his, cannot be broken. This is just an emphasize. You cannot break this ever. However, <laughs> and the however is, it can be so very deeply buried and so completely hidden that you have no awareness of its existence at all. And I think of my friend Bob Durst, who is a serial killer, who I see very much in that state of completely being lost. Uh, but at the same time, that's true. Uh, there's no one in whom the light has gone out completely, ever. So salvation is always, re return is also always possible. Um, John, John, that was very powerful, what you just said. My friend. My friend who is a serial killer. <laughs> you know, but there, there's a, there's a, you know, there, there's laughter amidst that, but of course there's, also, there's also a, a very truthful and compassionate and loving tone with that that there is no one here, regardless of their insane manner, that should not be our friend. Right. That's beautiful. Thank you for saying that. I laughed at it, but then I got it. Ah, that's beautiful. So for anybody who, who don't know, you, you may know who Bob Durst is. Um, he is a serial killer. Um, Bob Durst. Durst and Company, New York City, is, uh, was his father, they own lots of Manhattan. I won't go into elaborate, but he was my roommate in graduate school, right? So we were both 23 years old at the time. There were three of us that shared a house together. And so I got to know him, and, but this is prior to us having killed anyone, of course. Um, so I got to know him in a different way. You know, I got to know him as a, as a friend, right? And then strangely enough, we wound up living near each other in Westchester. I was in Katona, he was in South Salem uh, during actually the time that the first murder of his wife uh, occurred. Enough of that for now. Uh, but it was just, it's when you know somebody in a different way, <laughs> you know. But I also think that I realize that he's really almost completely split by that I mean has gone so, you can't kill someone, especially somebody that loves you, unless you're very split off, right? Okay. One more and then we're gonna take our break. Well, let's finish this slide. So you may believe you want it broken, and this belief does interfere with a deeper, deep peace in which the sweet and constant communication God would share with you is known. Underline the word constant communication. There's never a time that the Holy Spirit isn't there. There's never a time that you are not being given a really good, simple analogy. It's like a radio wave. This room, as you know, is filled with, you turn a radio on and instantaneously you would have a voice that was talking to you. In fact, as you could have hundreds of different choices of, of channels. And the Course is really asking us to just learn how to tune in, literally how to tune in to this voice. And sometimes it's really just the best way to do it is by getting very quiet 
I will illustrate that when we come back after our break. So let's take week's break till quarter of three.